we will share the recorded webinar after the fact, and it'll be available for all, for all of you to see. So let me just first of all start off by thanking Shinchi for sponsoring this webinar and Resource Management Inc. for the presentation you're about to to hear. If we're ready to go, I would like to get going so there's plenty of time left at the end for questions. So let me just go to the first slide here and I'd like to quickly introduce the presenters today. Charlie Hansen is a principal at RMI and he's been an integral part of the management of biosolids throughout New England for the past 30 years. Charlie works with more than 300 farmers, gravel pit owners, compost facility operators, and other end users of organic byproducts. Research for new agricultural uses as well as new res residuals management technologies also fall under Charlie's domain. Uh, RMI recently had the opportunity to partner with a longtime associate to offer a solution to wastewater facilities throughout the Northeast, and Charlie has spearheaded getting this Shinchi USA technology up and running. Along with Charlie, you're going to hear from Steve Nurmi, RMI sales manager for over 30 years uh, with sales experience. Uh, managing both national and regional sales teams. Steve manages a field sales team that covers all types of customers, including farmers, gravel pit owners, topsoil purveyors, compost facilities, and other end users of organic byproducts. Steve has been involved with this Shinshi USA technology from the beginning, traveling to China to see the technology firsthand before RMI implemented it the first unit in the USA. So um, with that, I just want to uh, thank them for the presentation you're about to hear. I think in addition to introducing you all to a new technology, this is really a story about adaptation, especially in the age of PFAS, which, is, which began as a way to save customers money. So with that, Again, if everyone could just mute your phones locally, I'm going to ask Charlie now to please uh, start the presentation. Very good, Janine. Thank you very much. Uh, just for a visual reference, uh, I am the guy in the top left, and Steve is the guy in the top right. That's we were out at Chicago at WEFTEC where that picture was taken. But. Um, we, uh, if you go to the next slide, Janine. Excellent. So we are, we're a recycling company. Um, we've done uh, residuals recycling for going over 25 years. Um, each year we recycle anywhere from three to 400,000 yards of organic materials, including biosolids, wood ash, short paper fiber and hydrosolids, mainly as it, um, items in our heart and soil product line. Let's go to the next slide, please. So I think most of the folks that are in attendance today probably know what organic residuals are, but just for those that are not, basically when we talk about residuals, they're byproducts from either municipal or industrial processes. They all have, the, the ones that we recycle all have uh, features that are good for, that are, can be beneficially used. And all the materials that we manage are regulated uh, in some form or another. Next slide. We cover mainly northern New England, Massachusetts, Maine, New Hampshire, New York, uh, uh, Vermont, and eastern New York. Um, that's what we've, our main service area the last few years, although we do do work occasionally in other parts of the country, mainly on a consulting basis. Next slide, please. So you're probably asking yourselves, well, what is a, a residuals management company doing with uh, trying to sell dryers? Well, it starts with the residuals. Um, over the last 25 years, 
certainly we've had different programs, particularly the biosolids the program that have had their uh, shares of challenges. Um, public perception, policy, regulatory requirements, all that sort of thing. Um, but we've managed to do it successfully. And up until a few years ago, we were just tootling along, dealing with the things that came up as they did. Next slide, please. Then came the issue of PFAS. Um, we weren't, when the EPA set their guidance value in 2016, we didn't even think about it. Um, we've gone through many, many different battles, particularly with biosolids over the years, and uh, it wasn't even to the level of some of those past issues. But then here, we're based out of New Hampshire, in central New Hampshire, and every year, uh, in the beginning of the year, we get together with our regulators just to review the prior year for our annual report. And in this January 2017, they said, oh, we'd like to uh, spend a little extra time with the groundwater folks and the, some hazardous waste folks. And we're kind of like, oh, okay. So uh, next slide, please. The reason was PFAS. Um, New Hampshire has been one of those states around the country uh, that has got some real hot button locations, the St. Gobain site in Merrimack, the Pease Air Force Base, um, the Coakley Landfill. And then, of course, we have some right next to us, Bennington, Vermont, Hoosick, New York. Um, I think probably many of you are at least vaguely familiar with the PFAS as is showing up in groundwater in many, many places we never thought of before. And so the reason... Uh, we, at that January 2017 meeting, that the other folks were there is the groundwater folks were keenly interested in what was going on adjacent to some of our land application sites. Next slide, please. So um, we kind of said, well, let's put on the brakes here. We've been working, many of our farmers, particularly our permitted class B farmers, um, we've worked with for decades. Um, we have a very robust market for Class A biosolids, um, but when the Stone Ridge Farm story in Maine broke in April of 2019, we literally had a couple farmers call up that were on the books slated to receive material and say, no, thank you, we don't want that. And so any company that does what we do has faced similar challenges within the region. Because when you have, in, in the case of like Maine, where they, some, they really went after some, some of the farms aggressively, those, some of those people have dropped out of what has been longstanding, very successful Class B programs. Can you go to the next slide, please? Well, in addition, the disposal capacity, forget about beneficial use for a minute, disposal capacity has started to get hampered. Um, we were even getting pushback from some landfill closure project work we'd done over the years. We had a couple landfills say, no, we aren't gonna take your material anymore because of PFAS. In August of 2018, we were gonna do a, a, make a manufactured topsoil using short paper fiber and biosolids at a Superfund site. And uh, last minute they said, oh, by the way, because of PFAS, we don't wanna use that material anymore. All our materials have been tested, and there's certainly there's PFAS in everything that we manage, um, but there, uh, there are no standards, and the, and the science is all a little suspect anyway. But then they start using words like responsible party, and that got us very concerned. So next slide, please. So this whole PFAS uh, issue is, is just, um, sort of increasing over as time goes on, got to the point where in May 2019, New Hampshire decided to sue manufacturers of PFAS. So next slide, please. We're, we're kind of like, okay, we're getting worried. We have uh, groundwater people looking at, at just going and doing random sampling at, at houses located all around our sites and uh, 
there's little science to support any of the decisions that are being made, but this is all being driven by mainly emotion at this point. So what are we going to do? And what if we don't have enough landfill or incinerator capacity? Well, next slide, please. It just so happened in April of 2018, Sun State Environmental Services approached us about a belt drying technology. So that was still early enough in, in the PFAS uh, storm that we're in that uh, we were really interested in what a quality product it made just from a, a land application perspective. We already had, we've been managing belt dried biosolids, the uh, um, waste of the Saratoga County over in Troy, New York had had a belt dryer that they brought up about four years ago and we'd been managing that product, we were familiar with it and knew how great it was. So in August, we traveled to China to see the technology firsthand. I should also mention the reason this company approached us was we had worked with one of the principals of that company for many years. He was a gentleman who had operated uh, Chuck Gerba's pathogen lab at the University of Arizona for many years. And that's, he brought us different class A technologies over the years, which anybody in wastewater knows, you know, some of these class A technologies are kind of like medicine man type stuff. They just are too good to be true. And so we were quite skeptical. So anyway, um, we put together a team consisting of Steve, and uh, we also used uh, a gentleman by the name of Andrew Carpenter, who I think some of you know. Uh, he is our technical expert that we rely on in these sorts of things, and he just so happens he'd actually been to China before, so he had that experience as well. So now what we decided to do is buy a couple dryers ourselves and partner with both Hooksit and Brattleboro, Vermont. But I'll turn it over to Steve now to talk about what he learned when he was in China. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. Yeah, so we were interested enough that I headed over to China with Andy Carpenter of Northern Silt that you can see there, the tall gentleman. Uh, many of you likely know him, and through the years he has helped us with evaluations and all. Uh, so we went over with the two partners from Sun State. We met with the, the team um, at Shinchi. We toward their operations, their manufacturing facilities, and we were very impressed with uh, what we saw over there. Um, we toured operative facilities that were doing volumes as high as 300 tons a day um, with um, multiple units, multiple dewatering feeding each unit. Uh, it was very, um, very impressive. And um, Shinchi was initially implemented in 2003 to dry fruits and vegetables. Uh, it was invented by Mr. Shu, who is a thermal engineer. And uh, there are, are many applications for it, but 2008 was the first biosolid application. Um, so for over 10 years, it's been out there performing in the biosolid uh, world and uh, delivering excellent results. Next slide, please. Um, so we came back, we started sharing the word. Um, the real big findings um, of this technology got a 80% reduction in cake to 90% solids on site, which is class A. Um, again, on site, we're not hauling any water at all. Um, the, um, the biosolids are an excellent fertilizer. Um, taking it straight to marketplace, whatever the beneficial reuse might be. And there's a great cost savings here um, and easier management of the biosolids. Um, but um, we're looking at 80% at less product and a 90% cake uh, that we're working with. Next slide, please. This is an example of a facility that has 12,000 annual tons of biosolids this is reduced down to 2,667 tons, um, or a reduction, uh, weight reduction there of four to five times the original weight. Um, that's at 90% solids. And that is an on-site Class A direct-to-farm. This is reducing the volume uh, by roughly 67% on volume and 80% on weight. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this here, so Shinchi offers both dewatering and drying or dehumidification. 
This is a schematic here for the dewatering. It is a spiral screw press. Um, the process here is it's receiving 1 to 3 percent liquid sludge. It mixes it in a uh, palmer, an automatic palmer station. That flows into the spiral filter press, uh, which has a series of rings, and it's one fixed ring, one loose ring with a little bit of space in between uh, that allows the filtrate uh, to be removed from the cake, uh, producing typically a 20 to 23 percent uh, cake, which is ready to uh, feed into the dryer. The basic rule of thumb is if you can make a ball out of the product that's feeding the, the dryer itself, that will work uh, to hold the shape, um, which we'll talk about in the dryer here, but uh, it, it's increasing the surface area with kind of a, a linguine-shaped um, product, uh, and you just need enough in the solids and the consistency of the product to hold that shape uh, when we're increasing the, the surface area. Uh, next slide, please. And also to make a note here, the dewatering and the dryer um, all can tie in through a PLC, uh, programma Programmable Logic Unit uh, controller to tie into the SCADA uh, at the facility. So the dewatering feeds the slitter box, which is on the left-hand side of the diagram there. Um, the cake drops into the slitter. Uh, it goes through two rollers, which creates that um, increased surface area that I was talking about. And what's different here with the slitter is the rollers, um, with the fiber and all that's in this product, um, the rollers don't get clogged up like extruders do. And most of the competition that's out there um, deal with extruders um, and not rollers. Um, so this product drops onto the belt. You can see on the top there, the belt is not constant. It loads for a minute to two minutes, and then it will sit for a while. The air comes up through the bottom. Uh, it's a perforated belt, but it's also a convection system, so it's, it's drying the product um, top and bottom. And depending on your individual product that you're dealing with, the cake that's on there, um, it's all adjustable. So the run time, the feed time, the sit time, and the speed of the belt itself uh, are all adjustable to uh, really dial in um, the finished good that you're looking for on your end. Then that air is all recycled that goes in there. The water is removed by condensers. It's discharged through a, a condensate that goes back to the headworks. And the air goes through a proprietary heat pump, which is reheated and um, recycled back through the bottom. So the belt on the bottom is typically 75 to 80 C, and the top belt is about 55 C. Um, for, I think that's about it. Next slide, please. Okay, Steve, um, hang on because I'm going to uh, show this video on YouTube. Okay. This will give you a better understanding of the two past slides that we just went through here. This is in Yuma, Arizona. Um, this will show both the dewatering and the dryer. Janine, there's no audio. Okay, thank you, Charlie. Nope. All right, let me try back at the. It was working. It was? Yes, the last five or ten seconds. I can hear that.
went silent again. You mean maybe you want to try the Brattleboro one instead? 10 4. I'm Charlie Hansen from Resource Management. We're here today to witness a historic event, the commissioning of the first... Can everyone hear that? Yes. It went silent again. Hmm. Oh, there it is. Janine, maybe what we should do is uh, both of these videos are available on our website, um, rmirecycles.com, and there's a Shinchi tab right at the top. Um, if you click on that tab, um, both of these videos are available. Um, it's just it's chugging on our end, and we don't have the audio with it. Okay, that sounds great, Steve. I will follow up with the links, and they're very brief videos. I would encourage everyone to watch those. Yeah, Let's there's continue three, then. Okay. Yes. Yeah, and they'll give you a great understanding with what I was uh, talking through on the last two diagrams with you. But the the units themselves being five RPMs, 180 degrees, say, a lot of moisture and minimal movement of the product. There's virtually no dust uh, that's created. You can open the doors while the machine is running and uh, very different than the other technologies that are out there at higher temperature, higher RPMs. Um, it, it's just really a different te technology, which is more dehumidification and evaporation than comparing it to a, a traditional dryer. They're also modular, which I was going to mention on the last one. So they can be uh, fit to whatever your input is, expected increase in, in production that you might have, or down the road if you need to increase it. Uh, there are really only two SKUs. There's a small unit, there's a large unit, and uh, they're modular at that point going all the way up to 111 feet, and at that point you would start running machines parallel, side by side. And they're operated by this one touchpad that's on your screen there. So everything is controlled uh, through that. You get an overview of all your heat pumps that are running. Uh, they come on and off as needed to be as efficient as possible. And that's all shown, your belt feed, uh, your slitter feed, all on a master um, tab here, as well as controlling the rest time, the run time of the belt, the speed of the belt. Uh, very simple, right on this one touchpad. Uh, if there is an alarm for any reason, you can set your own restrictions on there. That alarm will sound, and this touchpad here will give you the dialogue as to what needs to be corrected and, and uh, before it's. And a key point, too, is the fact <coughs> if, if it gets to a certain temperature, it will automatically shut itself down, um, which is a nice safety feature. Yeah, you can set the parameters um, as you wish through here. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, these are two units right here. This is a waste heat unit, uh, and you can see that it's repetitive. There are five units uh, together. Um, in these two pictures that are here. And as far as the efficiencies, um, just a couple stats for you. One kilowatt hour uh, is what is needed to dry or evaporate one gallon of water, or three and a half kilograms or so, which translates into about um, 180 kilowatt hours to dry one ton of cake from 20% to 90%. Um, on average there, it, it that's based on a 24-hour uh, operation. If you are running, say, a seven- or eight-hour shift, go up uh, slightly from there. And uh, 409 BTUs to evaporate one pound of water. So those are the, the main stats that we um, often discuss. Next slide, please. So how does the Shinchi technology here meet EPA Rule 503? Um, it's Class A biosolids on site. Um, we get the pasteurization through heat drying, 
Uh, we need to be in the system for over 30 minutes above 70 C. It takes about two hours and 45 minutes typically to pass through the machine. Uh, if your input's greater, you've got a larger, longer machine uh, with more bell time. Um, so you can stay in that same window. But the um, dryer itself runs reports to confirm that pasteurization is being achieved um, in the dryer. And then vector attraction reduction is achieved with the 90% solids uh, for the finished good. And just to be clear, that, that's sort of the most conservative way to do it. There are other variations depending on the type of, of solids you produce at your plant. Um, but by, if you do both, well, we always do the time temperature of greater than 70 degrees C for more than 30 minutes. That's done at the bottom belt, which is typically runs around 78 to 80 degrees C. Um, but some facilities wouldn't need to be to get to 90% to meet Class A requirements. Okay. And then as far as emissions and odor, it's really a it's a contained unit. The only discharge of odor, uh, vapor, anything is where the finished good product is coming out. Um, that product does not have much of an odor. It's a very earthy odor, and there's a little bit of ammonia that um, comes out of the condensate and the discharge at the end, uh, but very little odor. And again, as far as the finished good product, more of an earthy odor uh, as far as odor management. So by, the, the, by having our units here, our one in Brattleboro is running, um, this has been a great uh, tool for us to figure out how these things actually do work. Um, like having and operating it. The, the nice part about to, to emphasize this, the unit itself is extremely tightly sealed. And that's done when, you, when these units are installed, uh, Chinese technicians from Shinchi come to the United States and they actually help the, our American team from Sunstate put them together. And they go through and caulk and they gasket and they make that box just tight as a drum. So that means to Steve's earlier point, the only discharge point you have where odor can come up is that single auger. And that is a very, if you do have material, and some materials do have odor, don't get me wrong. It's very easy to treat though, because it's just that one point, either a simple scrubber right there at the discharge or an, a dis, or an outlet fan right there located adjacent would be more than enough to take care of the issue. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. And then this is a list of installations globally. So there are over 400 installations, many of those in Asia. Uh, they're moving into Europe. And it's relatively new as to the United States here with uh, the first unit out in Arizona, which is a portable unit, about two years ago. And then as Charlie referenced before, um, Brattleboro and Hooksett, um, Brattleboro, Vermont, and Hooksett, New Hampshire. Uh, that have these. But what's important is this is a proven technology. Um, they've been out there delivering results for uh, 17. 17 years. Uh, it's not serial number one. We're not working the quirks out here. It's proven. It's just new to the United States um, as a technology. Next slide, please. So the benefit uh, to treatment plants right here, we're decreasing the amount of solids four to five times. Uh, it's an excellent fertilizer <coughs> that on site can go direct to farm, uh, land application uh, of any sort. You're lowering the cost of your residuals management, the space involved to manage the residual, the trucking, all components of that. Um, there's, uh, let's see, the electricity and the waste heat. Waste heat is an option with this, but you need a consistent 90C feed uh, for that to, to be an option. And it's so efficient on the electrical side with the kilowatt usage that's out there, um, typically we would recommend the electrical uh, as the option there. And then uh, as an effective risk management tool uh, for land application, this is the direction we hope it goes. This is what RMI has done for 25 years. Um, we're a beneficial reuse land application company. Uh, whatever direction PFAS takes us here, it's still 80% less product. It's less product being trucked. It's less product for a tipping fee that might have to go to landfill. 
Um, same thing with incineration. Whatever the options might be in whichever direction uh, PFAS dictates our future going, uh, it really, by drying the product here, uh, it is the right way to go, and we are not hauling water at all. Um, next slide, please. But I will say um, I am an optimist. I feel like we will get through this PFAS storm that we're in currently. And as a farmer uh, as well, this product is awesome. It is so much easier. If, if you've been a traditional biosolids user using wet cake, once you use that dried product, um, you, you don't want to go back. And to Steve's earlier point, unfortunately, we've had to talk more in the last year and a half that, yes, drying is, is a great risk management tool uh, for the potential direction we're going in. But, again, we remain optimistic and are looking to get this product out and to, into our farmers' hands to make the best use of these nutrients as, as should and will be done, hopefully. Next slide. So that's it. I wanted to thank Janine for this opportunity and your help getting it all set up, Janine. And I also wanted to thank our teammate Erica here at RMI for helping us two old timers put this together. And uh, thank you all for taking the time to listen. We're happy to answer any questions you might have. So Charlie, this is Janine. I, I am tracking some of the questions in chat. And the first one that came up is, uh, what size slitter space is available? And uh, about five millimeters. Second. Okay. Hopefully that answers uh, that question. Could you repeat the efficiency stats again? Yeah. So it's one kilowatt hour required to evaporate one gallon of water, or three and a half kilograms. Then um, the other stat I had there um, was an average, so call it 160 to 200 kilowatt hours to dry one ton of cake from 20% to 90% solids. And it was 409 BTUs required to evaporate one pound of water. Thank you, Steve. Um, another comment question was, um, assuming that you're actually concentrating the PFAS in this um, end product, um, do you want to comment on that at all? Sure. Yeah, you, what we're, the initial things we're seeing at uh, Brattleboro is that there's really no change in PFAS concentrations at all. Um, and in fact, we actually tested our condensate water coming off process, and there was no, we did, it was all non-detect, so it's staying in the solids. All we're doing, this is not a PFAS, uh, this is not a PFAS treatment machine, to be clear. This is merely a risk management tool to make less product that has PFAS in it, if that makes any sense. Yes, I understand that. And so basically, you're not, you're just, you're not really concentrating, it's the same PFAS concentration. Correct. In a different form. Um, another question, Charlie, was what's the capacity of the mobile unit? Oh, the mobile unit is a very small unit. It's, it's only a Model 1200. Um, so that would handle in rough figures. If you were a treatment plant that made, say, 200 tons a year of cake, that would be approximately the size unit you would have. Okay, very good. I, at this point, oh, hang on, here's another question. Um, and the dimensions of the units, Janine, the smaller of the two that I refer to is 7.3 feet wide and eight feet high. Um, oh, wow. Ranging from 21 feet to 30 feet up to the 7200. And the numbers that we're referring to with the dryers are that's the amount of water that's evaporated, kilograms of water evaporated in a 24-hour period. So to give you, give those folks that are listening or watching uh, perspective, if they look at our videos, uh, the Brattleboro video, we have the same size unit. The, that's a model 4800. That's 
that dimension that Steve mentioned, the, the seven and a half by eight by 22 feet long. Um, and those facilities are, are managing approximately uh, 1,600 wet tons of cake per year. And I also, to that end, I would like to thank both our, our teammates at Brattleboro and Hooksett. They've been great to work with. And um, as we suspected, we needed some dedicated operators to help us troubleshoot and figure out some of these bumps in the road that you get for anything that's here for the first time, and it's it's been great so far. Thank you. Uh, we have a few other questions coming in. Um, someone is looking for some data on the condensate, the water quality, pH, et cetera. Uh, I don't know if you could speak to that now, if that's something you could share, we could follow up with. Yep. Um, I can probably the best thing to do would be to follow up and we can put together some actual um, hard data that you could post perhaps but just off the top of my head what we're seeing is uh, the sorts of things that come in the condensate are really ammonia um, and it has a, a higher pH um, pH is run around nine to nine and a half okay and to put in perspective, the machine, the, the machine that's in our Brattleboro video, our model 4800, when that's operating, that's creating between three quarters of a gallon to a gallon of water per minute. Okay. And that's being returned to the headworks, right? That was another question. Right. Uh, someone who's curious okay. about the ammonia levels in that condensate that's being recirculated. So we have preliminary data back that came back quite low. Um, and so it was low enough so that we are questioning it and we're going to be doing some more testing off of our actual machine running because some of the data we've seen from um, another machine was considerably higher, like around three or 4,000 parts per million um, of ammonia. So we're still working on quantifying that a little bit better. But we would fully expect to see some significant amount of ammonia in the condensate. Yes, understood. Another question, Charlie, is regarding the air recirculation and whether that is, in fact, 100% uh, recycling or whether there's a, a buildup of volatiles. Nope. Um, it is not 100%. You do, as Steve mentioned earlier, do get some air coming out of the discharge port, but the vast majority of, of that air is being recycled at that machine. And how about so the cost of these units? Fresh air being introduced into the machine when the slitter box runs, and then you have a little bit of air movement where it discharges where the dry product comes out of the machine. But the air within the dryer itself is being recycled. Um, the moisture is removed by two condensers in each unit. There are two heat pumps in each unit. Um, that recycled air goes down through two series of filters, um, catches whatever dust might be in there. Uh, the dust that we've found is at the 20 micron plus level. Uh, it's more of a granular component. It's not really a dust, and as I had said, you can you can open the doors to the unit while it's running. It's really just uh, kind of moist and warm. It's very different than the other technologies uh, that are out there for drying sludge. And then that product from the heat pumps crosses to the other side of the unit and is blown back up under the belt. Thanks, Steve. And of course, we have a question about cost and you guys you have two installations in the Northeast at this time. So can you speak to maybe the capital costs and, and installation costs? Sure. So in round figures, um, and this is not including tariffs, uh, just a, a dryer like you see in the video is approximately $180,000, just for perspective where a lot of the savings can come in these units is the fact that they are modular. So if you, again, to look at the Brattleboro video, we're using existing space. That space at Brattleboro is where 
that's their loading bay, and because of the way their um, biosolids loading was, we were able to use one of their discharge chutes to go direct into the dryer. We're actually going to modify that potentially. Uh, the, the way we'd like to set it up is how we have hooks it set up with an actual bin um, that will they'll be able to dewater into during their regular shift. And that way then they can build up a, a quantity during the, the shift and that, that will just continuously feed the dryer for 24 hours, four or five days a week. Because that's the dryers like to run continuously. That's where you get the most efficiency out of them. And if anybody has a question about that, they can contact me directly if, if you want to talk about a particular size of dryer and what that cost range is. And that's just the dryer. Thank you, Charlie. At this point, I, I'll open it up to uh, anyone that's on the line to ask a question using your audio. We have uh, 10 or 15 minutes left. Hey, everybody. This is Finn Appa, CDM Smith. Hey, Vin. Hey, Vin. Hey, Vin. How yeah. are you? Well. Good. So I recently visited Brattleboro, and I wanted to just give an independent perspective since I have seen numerous dryers globally, and I was thoroughly impressed with the quality of the construction. Um, I will preface, and it always depends on what your sludge is and what your liquid train process is, but um, even though there truly is not, like most dryers, a lot of fresh air intake besides what they said of a little bit that might get in the slitter box. The discharge at Brattleboro was pretty strong where they had to take a cheap, inexpensive uh, hose, flex hose with a, a fan and duck that outside because it was above um, health and safety standards for an eight-hour day. So that's something to keep in mind. But my, my question was, um, a lot of the components inside the dryer, at least at Brattleboro, the fans and the electric heaters, what are the materials of construction and are they proven to last over time in that warm and potentially corrosive environment? Yeah, it's uh, the piping in there is copper with the water and all. It's all stainless. Um, the chain and all the metal components that are in there are stainless steel. The belt itself is about two years old. It used to be a stainless, a perforated stainless with a nylon um, belt over the top of that. It's gone to that. If you look in the side door there, Vin, in Brattleboro, uh, the white plastic that's in there, I don't know the makeup, but that's been in R&D for a while, and that's what they've chosen. As far as combustibility and all, it's very high temperature. Uh, those holes do not clog because it really doesn't create a dust. Uh, in the cake that's on there, and uh, that's proven to be very efficient. So uh, I don't know what else you have specifically for the materials. I, I think the other thing is that's part of the reason we went to China um, to see these units. I mean, Steve saw units that have been in place for more than 15 years, and um, they, they have had remarkably few problems. They Thank you, guys. Well. That, that well, well, and also, if, if there is an issue, it's not you, – you don't encounter a complete um, shutdown with what's happening or a complete failure. If you've got five units like the image that we looked at up there and one of the heat pumps is failing on you, you just adjust your bell time uh, to go through there and you fix that heat pump. Um, again, it's five RPMs. It's 180 degrees. It's a very mellow process uh, and easy to stay on top of the filters typically are are cleaned out once a week. No maintenance. There's you know, the chain and all that goes in there, but and asking and we have not found anybody who's really encountered any type of a uh, a complete failure uh, with any of the units. Thank you, Steve. Ben, does that answer your question? Yes it does. Thank you very much. You. All right. And if if you're not speaking please put your phone on mute. A um, couple more questions, guys. Um, can you speak to explosion risk? Yes, we actually were waiting to get back. We 
have actually hired a, uh, a fire engineer to do an evaluation. And the preliminary indication, we don't have the final report yet, is that it is uh, a minimal issue. Um, I'll be able to speak to that more accurately once we get that report. Um, and I probably ought to leave it at that at this point. Okay. Fair enough. Um, someone was inquiring about the size of the Brattleboro unit. Is it uh, 1,600 dry tons per year? Not dry tons. It's 1,600 wet tons per year is what okay. they produce. And that, that's a model 4,800 dryer. And it, it was chosen to, in theory, run five days a week, 24 hours a day to, to d dry all their cake to 90% plus. Excellent. So the size um, of that, to put it in perspective, is about seven and a half feet wide, eight feet high, 21 feet long for a 4,800, which is at Brattleboro. Okay. No, thank you for that. Um, and then, of course, one of the realists on the phone is asking about when you spoke about the white plastic uh, belt material, whether or not that has PFAS in it. It's a good question. <laughs> whoever, that person, whoever that person was, we're on the same page because that's exactly what I was thinking about. But uh, so far, and we've, this is just one round of data we've gotten back. Again, there wasn't much difference between the PFAS levels in the dried product versus the PFAS levels on the wet cake going in. So if it does have PFAS, it doesn't appear to be contributing anything to that final dried product. But I'm spot on with whoever that was. Thank you. Yep. Other questions, uh, people on the line? Well, it seems we've answered all the questions. That was a lot of questions. Uh, I'll just comment that uh, I want to thank Charlie and Steve for their presentation and thank Shinshi for sponsoring this. Um, I will follow up. We've recorded this webinar, so I can follow up with a, a link to that as well as a link to the two YouTube videos, very short videos that uh, where Charlie shows the installation at Brattleboro, one of them anyway. And uh, any other questions, Charlie, that you jotted down that you weren't able to respond to right away, I can include that as well in the follow-up. So. Okay, great. All right, so thank you guys very much. Thank you, everyone, on the call. Hopefully you learned one thing. That was the purpose of the Lunch and Learn. And oh, enjoy the rest of your first. Yeah. Yeah. If I can add, if anybody's interested in coming to Brattleboro to see a unit running, we do tours one day on Thursdays typically, and if they contact either Steve or me, we'd be happy to try to schedule you in. Well, I would, I'd be very interested in that, so you can sign me up. I'll give you a good date, a good Thursday to go, uh, but Sounds I can also good, include that information with the follow-up as well. Thanks, Charlie. Nothing like right, seeing it you. yourself. Outstanding. Thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend. You too. Enjoy. Thank you, Janine. Thank, thank you, you guys. Bye.